I got a little, I got a reputation. No, I'm kidding. That's <laughs> fine. One of the cool bit, cool bit right. things besides zero. Uh, Testing one, two, three. <sighs> Never leave your laptop open on a, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're having fun tonight. Oh, that didn't sound like you're having fun. Come on. Are you having any fun at all? Yeah. All right. Day one. Got a, a bunch of talks in the uh, uh, laptop over here. We've had a good time. I think we've had a good time. Has everyone gone out and played around, done some lock picking, uh, played Halo, anything interesting? Okay, apparently not. Okay, we're done. Thanks, guys. It's been real. So, um, wow. Yeah, it's been a hoot so far. Having an absolute blast. Uh, I, I was going to go downstairs and work on the badges some and play around, do some uh, drag soldering, and uh, Wynn says, no, 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 you, you got to be in here for this one. So someone find me a good spot to sit because I want to kick back and relax. And uh, yes, Shane, I, I want to sit on your lap. Your, actually, can I sit across Spiky? Okay, good, good deal. Huh? Can I sit on the couch? Is there room? Yeah. Yeah, we'll make room. That'll work. So um, one of the fun things about getting to do stuff like this is uh, getting to watch my friends get up on stage and do talks. And uh, uh, this has got to be one of the craziest ones I've ever heard, but it's going to be the, one of the most interesting talks I've heard in quite some time. There's a uh, – don't do that to me now. You said it was going to be awesome. I heard it. Oh, is that, oh, 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 I got engineered on that one, didn't I? So, um, yeah, uh, uh, Wynn is going to come up here and uh, knock our socks off with some really interesting, fun stories. Uh, I've had the pleasure of having dinner with him many times, uh, hanging out with him at conferences and uh, watching him speak, and uh, he's an absolute hoot. And uh, I, am, uh, uh, I am definitely um, honored to call him a good friend. So... When if you want to come up here, you can actually use the steps. No, 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 no. You're going to jump? No, I'm not. Just give me that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I used to be in the music business. That qualified me to do security. And over the years, I have been accused of a lot of things, and one of them has been, you look at shit really weirdly. Well, I'm now going to explain to you why I look at shit so weirdly. And it's because I did survive rock and roll. My father, see the, see the resemblance here, right? He uh, worked uh, during World War II in the development of the oscilloscope and uh, some early radar systems. My mother was the first record engineer at NBC during World War II. She had us at home as, as when I was five, six years old, editing tapes on our home studio because we lived in a bad neighborhood. So I got to play around with this stuff. Then I got to go to my first DEF CON. <laughs> Long before Jeff Moss ever thought about it. Then I became a TV repairman. Anybody remember a TV like this? No. Uh, I was like, gee, I actually remember that stuff from back then. And then my father became a beatnik. He became a record engineer and producer, and he produced Peter, Paul, and Shithead, uh, Bob Dylan, Nairobi Trio, uh, Tab Hunter, Conci Connie Francis, that whole era of stuff. And I grew up around the music business. Louis Armstrong taught me that how to play when the Saints come marching in when I was six years old, and Ella Fitzgerald was roaring drunk at one of our parties. I actually remember some of this shit growing up in this business. This was my neighborhood electronics store. So when I became an early geek, that is where I had to go, and this is what we got to do and buy from. And this was what in our day, do-it-yourself shit. This is really what you had to do. And that was when you needed a bit, you'd run downstairs, run across the block, and get the bits that you needed, come back, because Radio Shack had not even been thought of yet. I built my first computer in 1961. Analog computer, which meant some parts, some potentiometers, some resistors, not even diode logic at that point. 
but computers were really, really cool. And I remember that year I got a book on diode logic on how to build adders and subtractors and multipliers before integrated circuits, and the book was written by IBM. And I said, oh, I'm going to become a computer guy. And I was nine years old and had no clue what I was doing whatsoever. In high school, we ended up with one of these things, punch cards. I sucked at programming. Oh, my God, was I awful. Because, but we did have a good hack. Remember punch cards? And one of the great hacks back in those days that we figured out was we used to get utility bills on punch cards. No, you're too fucking young. <laughs> Who remembers punch card utility bills? Remember those? Well, what we found out was to the left of the amount of money that you owed the utility company, there was a blank field. What do you do with it, guys? Negative number. I got a refund every month for the amount of utilities I used. That was my early foray into computing, and that was kind of a cool hack. But at the same time, I was into the music industry, and because of my parents and my father, and I was going to sessions and hanging out and down in Greenwich Village and messing around with guitars and redoing sounds and all that kind of stuff. So I had this mixed interest at the time. But at the age of 16, I said, computers are nothing. Well, we didn't have a computer industry, but we had a music industry. So when you're 16 years old and you have a choice to go work with rock and roll or go to college, what's the choice? Rock and roll. Rock and roll. My first recording session. Who is that? Stark naked in the studio. Who is that? Who? That's the Nuge. 1969, that was my first lathe and my first experience with, again, analog computers, cutting the old vinyl discs, and we had to learn how to manipulate analog computers for analog motors to be able to get them all to, and you're going to hear this word several times, synchronize properly together. We use the word synchronize a whole bunch these days, don't we? Back then, it just meant, so the little grooves in the vinyl didn't step over each other, because if they did, it would never master, and then the records would suck. And so that was my first, and I guess I was 16 years old, learning how to do all this stuff, and it was way cool at the time. So along comes computers and audio, and one of my first things was working on, down with Hendrix, does anybody recognize that device on the right? It's the original Moog from Electric Ladyland Studios in New York. And that was where, when we were building the studios there, um, Robert Moog was, that was his demo site upstairs. And that was semi-sorta kinda computer. But what it began to teach me very, very early was the concept of systems. Because you had to make all these boxes and all these little elements, an oscillator here and a waveform shape here and an adder and an XOR and all these things and you had to build it on the fly, patch it all together, and pray that the sound you got out was going to work. But at the time, that was the leading edge, and we had an absolute ball screwing with that stuff, but I'm a lousy musician, so I had another epic fail with that, but the technology was awesome. We all had one of these at the point. Assembly programming is not for me. Another epic fail, I got the lights to link up, I got a cassette tape tied to it, and then it was, this is too damn hard for me. I'll let Georgia do it sometimes. Is Georgia in the room? No, she's down at the bar somewhere. All right. So epic fail there. But then we got to play with a really cool computer doing a TV show for Lauren Bacall. And that's a PDP-8. And again, the concept of synchronization comes into play here because we had audio, which was the bastard stepchild of television back in the 1960s and 70s. Ah, sound. Who cares? Here's one mic. Doesn't matter. Video was the only thing that mattered, but we went in as the sound guy saying, no, sound matters. So we brought all this incredible sound equipment in, trying to synchronize it through a computer that would never work. So there were some issues, and I'll show you how we solved them later on. I finally bought, and my wife remembers, the first computer when she became a computer widow. Finally, something I could actually do with a little chiclet keyboard, the bigger keyboard, and I had... 280K floppy disks, yeah, and I upgraded to 32K RAM. So I had, a, I had a massive system tied to a Centronics printer, and we actually did sort of kind of 
build and make it work for this inventory system that we were doing. And I could have done a hell of a lot better using a piece of paper. Then along came in the audio industry. Over on the right there is a thing called AutoSet. The big device is a recording console. The faders in this case were automated and they slid up and down using a device called a VCA, a Vultures Controlled Amplifier. And the controls out of AutoSet were supposed to adjust the mix so you could mix it once, make a minor change, and everything would go great. What was the only problem we had here, Trevor? It didn't work. It didn't fucking work. <laughs> and my wife was building them. She worked at the factory at the time here in Nashville. So we went out and sold them, and that was my wife. This is back in the AES. Isn't she hot? You know, she's back there now, so, right? Raise your hands, hot woman. There you go. <laughs> and so we went out and sold all this bullshit that never worked. Sounds like vendors today, doesn't it? But it was kind of cool back in the day to, to play in that space. And then we had our own studio uh, up in New York, and I refused to go computerize at all because my entire experience with anything to do with computers and audio or video was epic fail. Nothing ever worked because we were so early in the process and integrated circuits were just starting. Then my life of epic fails with audio began and I had already said no to automation, did not want any part of it. I wanted to stick to doing it the way that my father did it, my mother did it, is that you as the engineer are part of the band. Therefore, you're contributing to the sound, like George Martin did to the Beatles, he didn't screw it up, he enhanced it. The job of the recording engineer and producer is to enhance it, not to screw it up. But life as it is in the music industry, and it's still true today, shit happens. 1975, we're down in Jamaica. Stevie Wonder, Bob Marley, big deal going on, and we hear through the consulate, for the British consulate, because they were in political control at the time, that the Jamaicans were going to riot. Please build riot cages into the stage. And we're going, no shit, we just want to get stoned and play some music. <laughs> no, you got to build riot cages in. So we uh, built riot cages into this stage, and there were about 120,000 people in the concert. Everything was going swimmingly. The video was filming, the lights were going, the audio was going, everybody's jamming. Until a blackout. The entire stadium went black. There was no audio. There was no nothing. And we got 120,000 people that are ready to riot. And the Jamaican cops don't carry guns. What do you do? Run. Run. Are you French? No. <laughs> what do you do? How you fix the problem, exactly. What do you do, Trevor? What do you do? Shout it out. What do you do in this case? What's your first gut reaction to do? What? Bullhorn for every musician. Where's the breakers? All right, what we found, and it was not me, it wasn't, it was one of the roadies used to work for a power company. The power transformer, everything in the entire stadium was plugged into one power transformer. What happens to a power transformer when everything gets plugged into it? It overheats. So what did we do? We found some CO2 cans. So the roadies run over and take the CO2 cans and start blasting away on this transformer to cool it down. What happens to the two roadies? They get arrested for terrorism. And we have to go sort this out. There's no lights. You've got crazy people in the stadiums, and we have like 60 seconds to talk the cops out of arresting them to get the lights going on. What did I learn from this as it relates to security? This shit isn't cyber, it's physical. Everything we do one way or another is physical. Power is God. No matter what anybody tells you, with the upcoming ICS SCADA shit we're gonna be going through the next few years, that 
is God. That's the stuff that we really need to be fixing down here. We had no backups whatsoever. We had no backup cabling, no backup transformer. We didn't have a double plug-in situation, no alternate routing. We were under a complete single point of failure for the entire concert, knowing we were going to have riot conditions. Think differently. Think you, you just got to throw out every rule. You know, when G. Mark was talking earlier, people in the rules, and we got to buy by the rules. Oh, screw the damn rules. Fix the damn thing and ask for forgiveness afterwards. Same thing in your networks. When the shit hits the fan, you got the permission? Or do you just go off and fix it and worry about the repercussions later? And this taught me really, really early. You got to be absolutely be prepared for no matter what the hell happens and be prepared to do anything it takes to get, in our case, in our language today, mission critical systems up and running. And if you're not planning for it, your organizations aren't planned for it, you will sooner or later have an epic fail. Hopefully not with 120,000 people rioting, but a few billion dollars going through the wrong servers or a NASDAQ collapse, or we can look at any of the collapses we've had. Same problem, and they will, 95% of them, run back to single point of failure and not planning for good DR and recovery. A couple of years later, we're working with Liza Minnelli, Liza with a Z. And it's a, if you, you can download it for free. It's really a very good show if you're into that kind of music. And we were doing something very unique. Because of the union laws in New York at the time, we were not allowed to film a Broadway show live unless we use uh, the union musicians. We didn't want to use the union musicians because we had already recorded the album in the studio. But the union musicians had to show up and get paid anyway. So we have 60 musicians down there and we bring along a four track tape machine with our pilot tracks, with the audio from recording in the studio with the high quality stuff. That was gonna be used for sound reinforcement. Liza was gonna sing live. So what we were gonna do is play back this, have the synchronization again, sync is very important here, on here, another sync signal up here, record her live vocal, then go back and everything is gonna be perfect once we get back to the studio, right? Guess what happened when we got back to the studio, Trevor? No, no it wasn't that bad, thank <laughs> God. We, did have, we actually had two Nagras, so it was all right. The synchronization signals were out of sync. So we had a one hour TV show where the audio and the video did not match up whatsoever. Anybody ever have a database problem like that? A few of you are not admitting it, contact lists, updates, mobile devices, all the crap that goes with it. So what did we have to do? We had to go down to the little electronics store that I showed you earlier and build something because we had to deliver by Sunday night, and this was Thursday. So what we did, we built this setup where we created what's called a Lissajou pattern on an oscilloscope, and we compared the rotational speed of the motors in two separate tape machines and synchronize them manually by eye for a period of 94 hours of remixing back in the studio. The sync was complete drift the entire time and we had to build it four bars at a time, watching that pattern. And that was my job. That my job was to watch the frickin' patterns and keep it, and you had to adjust the knobs just so, and when it fell out of sync, the producer would curse at you because it was clearly my fault for all of this. Takeaways. Anybody know how to do manual synchronization of databases and backups anymore? Okay, we got one guy. Sync is gonna fail. It's part of the world we live in. In those days, it was hysteresis of synchronous motors. Today, it's slightly different. We have different technology, but the fundamental principle of synchronization is absolutely key to everything that we do. Have your tools ready. It's back to the concept of DR and backup. 
have the tools ready that you might actually need. And unlike one of our big clients down in Wall Street who thought they had a DR facility when they lost power, it fell over to battery, and the trading floor was doing fine for 31 minutes, they were going to kick over the generators, but they had not tested the generators in two years. Test and exercise. Synchronization is key. Whether it's internal to your enterprise, across all of the platforms that you're trying to keep working together, or it's with your backup and DR facilities, or you're in the cloud, the principle is the same. Have a manual backup procedure for all of your synchronization. So a few years later, I end up into a similar situation with Rod Stewart and working on the Double Fantasy album. We were trying to do the following, link two 24-track machines together so that the artistic mus uh, musicians would have 48 tracks and they could do all the great stuff they wanted to do. And this device up here is the counter and the synchronization device for these two 3M tape machines, antique technology by today's standards. So we get in and the first one we were doing was on Do You Think I'm Sexy? We got a panic call, come down and the problem with the synchronization device was, it was out of sync again. So this was eight years later with way advanced, and this was digital technology, but the problem was they were still using hysteresis synchronous motors, which have a mechanical traction built into them, which allows them to fall out of sync. So again, we had to go back to a manual sync mode of operation on both Rod Stewart's album and Double Fantasy was largely done with manual synchronization across all of these. A few years later, no, this was actually only two years later, we were doing a concert for Charlie Daniels. You guys have heard of Charlie Daniels, haven't you, Trevor? Yeah. yeah. And it was at Madison Square Garden. Very, very simple, remote job. And we were out at the convention in Los Angeles and flew back to New York for this. And it was really simple. We had a nice recording console in our remote truck and a 16-track tape machine so we could put the bass here and the drums here and the voice here and all this other stuff. When we got there, didn't work. It didn't work for something that I still to this day have no idea and we had zero time to deal with it then. Because of a ground loop, which is an analog problem, and I grew up an analog engineer, it meant that every single microphone channel and every single microphone signal ended up on every single wire. What do you do when you've got 20 minutes and you're going to go live? What do you do? 20 minutes, dude. This is Madison Square Garden. I got union fuckheads to deal with. Kill yourself was damn close. What we had to do, and it's a skill that doesn't unfortunately exist too much anymore, but again, it relates to mission critical operations today. When the show must go on, and there is no choice at all, you have to go to manual mode. We did everything and took it live down to one single mono track. One shot to get it right. If we screwed up, it was bad news completely. But the, it was, I look back on it, I have still have a copy of that and it sucks, it's awful. But the client understood and we got out of trouble and they broadcast the thing finally but we had to go completely manual. And this is about the concept of graceful degradation in your networks. When the shit hits the fan, can you operate in a minimized mode? Do you have the internal skill sets somewhere on your team to operate in manual minimized mode so at least you can disconnect the stuff that's causing the headache and accomplish something? And that's called prioritization, whether you're doing a live concert where we have no dress rehearsals, where it's one shot live, that's it. And sometimes in our networks, it's exactly the same way. Didn't we see that with the Obamacare website? They did a damn good job on prepping for that one, didn't they? Jeez, not politically speaking. I'm just speaking that 
Canadian company that screwed up. People forget, the, anybody remember the 1970 movie with Yul Brenner called Westworld? Where nothing can go wrong, guess. <laughs> Something is always gonna go wrong. And this gets back to security budgets. I heard people about that talking about that earlier. Security budgets, because everything worked fine. You don't need more money. Well, it'd be kind of nice to have some backup DR, redundancies, the things that people say they'll never need. You need them. You absolutely have to have them. And as Rosanna Rosanna Dana would say, you know it's always something. It's always something. And Murphy lives in the audio business. It lived in the live recording and TV business. And it lives in our business. And every one of us have met Murphy many, many, many times. But organizations tend not to want us to be able to financially and technically prepare for when Murphy shows up at the door. And so that's why some of my analog engineering experiences I found to be very, very useful as I got into this space when I was talking to people because it gave me a hardcore reference and they could relate to analog a lot better than they can relate to digital. But the remote situation seems like it's the worst, but we were doing a commercial for Alka-Seltzer. Real simple situation, in a controlled environment in one of the finest recording studios in New York. So we had a nice old console and an eight-track Scully machine. Real simple, you got 40 musicians gonna go plop, plop, fizz, fizz, that whole thing. We're gonna record it, and everything's gonna be great, musicians go home. Power supply to the console died. Made in Germany, there is no backup. What do you do? You got 40 guys sitting out there. You got Doyle, Dane, and Burnback, a big advertising agency spending $22,000 an hour for this thing. What do you do? You got to improvise. And this is where DIY comes in. And thankfully, thankfully, where I worked at the time, they allowed us the luxury of having backup. So we built, in about a half hour, a complete alternate recording console out of bits and pieces that we found around, lying around the shop and around the studio. We scarfed up everything, strung hundreds of wires, and actually mixed live on those little tiny mixers into the machine, bypassing the entire system. And I know that in the data world, I've been in enough situations myself where I would love to get that shit just the hell out of the way and go do it this way, and then, okay, then we'll solve it and fix it all later. Again, it's having the bits and the pieces and having some exercise and going through as to what can go wrong. Whether you're in my old analog world or in the current digital world, the principle is exactly the same. Graceful degradation, disaster recovery, the lessons are very similar. You just don't know which direction they're gonna be coming from. Lots of other lessons. We did a thing with Hank Williams Jr. Uh, a couple gay guys out at the Lone Star Cafe threw drinks on him. So instead of doing a 48 minute set so we could release an hour album, he did 14 minutes. What do you do? Improvise was not exactly our big, uh, the big thing we could do there. It ended up that we had to fill airtime live with some real bullshit and then back in the studio, steal stuff from his album and make it sound live and crappy in order to rebuild the show. Didn't work very well. BT Express, this was amazing. I was down at a studio recording them. It was 1977. It was in July, late July. And we're doing a playback on a 16-track hysteresis synchronous analog motor. And we play it back, and it sounds for a moment just for a moment, like something went out of tune. Well, that's just something that never ever happens in a recording studio. Things are always in tune because they're relative to their own standard. It's not an absolute. It's relative to their own, uh, whatever the speed is that the uh, machines are operating at. And so Eddie says to me, what's wrong? I said, oh, you know, Con Ed always balances the power frequency between 10 to 12 and 10 after 12, and there were frequency fluctuations, so we would never record roughly between 11.30 at night and 12.30 in the morning in order to give Con Edison the flexibility so it wouldn't mess up the tape machines and playback later on. However, in this case, it was about 7.30 at night. So being a flippant, long-haired asshole, 
I said, there's a blackout coming. Two minutes later, New York City blacked out. <laughs> that session was over. There was no recovery from that, because that goes back to power is God. We didn't have or need the complete backup facilities and the power generation, didn't need it. But there is, for us, there was no way to plan for a blackout, but today DR is about planning for at least localized recovery and remediation, even if you have to go to a graceful degradation shutdown. So again, the history is here from another industry that is well experienced at epic fails, and we need to apply more of it to our world. And I look at it from the world, the approach of systems. And one of the things that we had in that day was the ability very easily to reroute signals, move things around. When something broke, it was easy to bypass it. Systems were designed in such a way that you assumed something was going to fail. And a lot of that technology was vacuum tube based. And it, like old vacuum tube computers, they had full-time people just replacing tubes on a regular basis. And they too had digital patch bays back in the 1940s and 50s to bypass these systems. When you are building your routing tables and your routing hardware systems, are they constructed in such a way that when something goes wrong, you can bypass it, get around the problem, replace it with something new very simply, or just throw a couple of patch cords, whether they're RJs or they're going to be uh, the optical cables, doesn't matter. The principle is the same. It's a systems analysis. This was the first studio I ever worked in, and the patch bays and how to get around and manipulate these things was part and parcel of what we had to do. And I just fear that much of what we're trying to do these days, we're not teaching the next generation of kids how things fail and how to get around these types of problems because we're architecting things for financial expediency, not for repair expediency and maintenance when things go wrong, which is why we're seeing the kind of failures we are. Com complex systems. We were dealing with massively complex ones, and how many of us have seen patch bays and network closets that look like this? Do they give you the ability to do a fast swap out and repair? <laughs> Again, these lessons should be fairly simple, fairly intuitive, but when management says, oh, good, well, that, that's done, you, you can fix it later, go off and build this now, that is absolutely contrary to keeping any sort of systems up and running on the kind, with the kind of reliability that we are expecting. One of the other things that we used to do is when we get a new piece of equipment in, it had hundreds of knobs on it. And one of the things we did just because we did it, and I didn't really realize until many years later why we did it, we would take the equalizers and crank them all the way up and all the way down. Take everything, crank everything all the way up. How do we screw with this system before we go live with it? Because in the nature of audio and video, when you're going live, you wanted to know your environment. Same thing today. How many of us really stress test what the vendors give us? Do you go through all the buttons, all the knobs, or you just kind of, let's get it working and then we'll go play with it later? I see too many people trying to play with it later, or what we used to call it back in those days, we'll fix it in the mix. Don't worry how bad it is, we'll fix it later. And what happens to costs, what happens to security, we're seeing the results of that in our world today. We can do the same thing, those are the virtuals. I've got a couple virtual recording consoles at home, and done the same thing and played around with them, and I've been able to break some stuff. But again, this should be part and parcel of what we're building into enterprise. And one of the reasons is that complexity is the antithesis of security. The more complex the system, the harder it is to find out what's wrong, the more likely something is to gonna go wrong, whether it's a vendor problem, an operator error, an administrative configuration error, acts of God, doesn't matter. Complexity is the antithesis of security. When you're designing, when you're implementing, when you're building, keep it simple. We've heard this over and over and over again. And when we look at some network diagrams that people are using today, it still astounds me the massive amounts of complexity that are built into systems because people tend to look at it due to organizational charts 
at the tactical level, not at the strategic level. They're not looking at it from 50 or 100,000 feet. They're looking at it from their own little DLP bit bucket or the little SIM or big data bit bucket and not the whole big picture about architecting a system for failure. And it's all about time. And this goes back to my growing up with an analog world. Time, in my opinion, is the common metric we have for security. And there's some formulas and all that. I'd be happy to go over them with you. But every single one of these relates to time. And in this case, protection time, detection time, and reaction time is about how fast can I catch something that's going wrong and how fast can I remediate it. And then you take that math and figure it out against how well the devices or the technology is going to be protecting or should be protecting the actual data or systems, whatever it is I'm trying to do. By using formulas like this, you can start analyzing things and bring them into the risk analysis world, look at exposure time, bandwidth time, and if anybody's interested, I've got a whole series of math on this, that will actually be able to take numbers over to the risk analysis and the financial people and say, here is the risk. But unfortunately, very limited number of people are actually playing this game. One of the other principles that we had back in our day was feedback. And we've all heard the squeals. If I put this in front of here, uh, I know, don't do it, I know. I'm going to get feedback. The reason I don't get feedback is because I have a fair amount of distance and there's a thing called attenuation or the signal level is going down. Now, that's in the acoustic world. In the electrical world, we have an amplifier, and the only way to keep it from going crazy or getting it going out in, into an, a run mode is to put feedback in it to attenuate the signal and control it. And that's what a volume control actually does in most modern technologies. In the mechanical world, what do we call that? Anybody? A governor. Exactly. It's a feedback mechanism to keep runaway conditions from existing. How much feedback do we apply in network security? What, zero? Or is that a four, three finger, or one finger, or a zero at me? Zero. zero. So let's take a look at something. Let's take any protection process at all. And let's say that that protection process should take five seconds, five milliseconds, 20 clock cycles, doesn't matter set an arbitrary level to it, start a clock, and if it doesn't occur within the prescribed amount of time, take a remediative action of some sort. Simple feedback process to be applied at any protection process, authentication mechanisms, access control points, it doesn't matter where you put it, it's 11 lines of code that can put feedback process to keep systems from getting in runaway mode, and runaway mode in our terminology today means Data breach means bad guy getting into the networks, doing something wrong, the system collapsing, uh, whatever it is that's going to go wrong, and we're not going to go through the whole litany of those things. But this modeling of taking time for protection process, if it takes too long, something's wrong. When you go home, or when you go to an office, you open the door and you have 15 seconds to get over to the thing, put the key and enter the code, otherwise the cops are going to come. Same sort of principle. We've been doing feedback for hundreds of years, but we have neglected it in the network security modeling that we're doing. Time-based takeaways. Feedback is a pure time function. Pure time function, that's all that it is. We know the measurements. We can measure our IDS. We can measure our SIM. We can measure all, so many aspects of our networks with the metric of time, but do we do it? No, it works, it's fine. Oh, we got a ping time of 13 milliseconds. Must be good. What is really going on underneath the hood? Network collisions occur because, many times, time synchronization is off. Again, same problems we had in a prior industry, we've got them today. And one of the reasons we think this way is because a lot of people think that the digital world is binary. And I don't believe that it's binary at all. Now, I happen to have synesthesia. That's what music looks like to me. But it's all analog waveforms. They're sine waves, and that's acoustically what we hear. When we hear distortion, it's no longer a sine wave. It's clipping or cutting it off, and it's going to start looking more like what's called a modified sine wave or a square wave. 
Now, a lot of people believe that in the digital world, everything is completely binary. Well, semi sorta of maybe in some view. If you have a continuously variable signal, that's fine. But then you digitize it, and that's how we do digital audio and MP3s. It's time-based sampling, and that determines the quality, which again, is it should be a big hint to network security people when you look at time uh, multiplexing. If you have more samples, over a given period of time, you have a higher quality. Same thing with time-based security. The more often you sample and look at the events inside your network and create a feedback loop in order to be able to have a reaction to something that is going wrong, the better control and that feedback loop that you're actually going to have. What we actually have is continua, continuums. And if we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, it goes from what we typically say DC to light, and it goes from zero hertz up to 10 to the however many. It's a continuum. And we need to start looking at much of what we're doing in the networking world as a continuum versus these binary functions of it's either this or this. There's too many variables. For example, real simple, help desk. I'm going to call Trevor for the help desk, and I'm going to say word doesn't work. That's a binary condition, isn't it? Yeah. Solve it. Uh, <laughs> thank you for calling. <laughs> <laughs> that binary condition seemingly is asking for a binary answer. But it's an analog answer, because there are lots and lots of questions and criteria that must be determined in order for him to be able to then figure out, oh, you forgot to turn it on, or whatever the simple, simplistic answer is. When you look at help menus, how deep are they? I mean, not help menus, when you look at menus on software, it goes forever deep. These are not binary, it's on or it's off. There's thousands and thousands of conditions that may or may not have been exercised like we used to do with turning all the knobs. And I remember Microsoft, they said they put in 10,000 hours of testing on Vista. And I did some math, and I said, you just released 60 million copies of it. 10,000 hours, 60 million copies times 100 hours. And the math got, so we are the beta sites. We are the beta sites for this type of thing. When we look at Asperger's, nobody in this room has Asperger's, right? It is not an either or, you've got it. And some people have said, oh, you got autism, binary function. Asperger's, binary function. No, it's a spectrum. It's a spectrum like everything, because networks are still about human interaction. And since we are an analog creature, and the devices are digital creatures, this whole balance and the way we view networks and view data streams, we need to shift some of our perceptions and look at it a little bit differently in order to be able to integrate with it and create environments that are going to be more human friendly. And there's lots of ways to do this, and I don't have time to get into that today. But we are binary. I'm sorry, we, we are analog devices. We as carbon units, we don't understand how this works entirely yet. But when you start then thinking, and I have to bring it in a little bit of quantum mechanics, there are some theoretical limits, and the theoretical limits, there's two of them. One is, is Planck's time, 10 to the minus 43rd seconds, at which point we no longer know what happens. And that would be going into a pure analog world versus a quantized world. Maybe, maybe not, we don't know. Same thing with Planck's distance, 10 to the minus 35 centimeters. We tend to think of distance being very quantified when in fact it may have an analog underneath of everything. And all I want you to do is think about the difference between analog and digital when you're examining problems. Because if you look at it from this analog way and sine waves and the way the technology used to be, you're gonna start coming up with different answers and different approaches to problems both from the conceptual, through the design, construction, and ultimately through remediation. What's the answer? DIY. That was for you, Trevor. That's for you. I grew up on the magazine on the left. And apparently this one on the right is now 2012. So we were DIYing with little tiny bits and pieces and having to construct it from the most basic electronic elements that were really big. And today we got it all miniaturized. But the DIY mindset is still very similar. What can I do on my own? How do I take technology 
and use it for me, for what I want to do and learn from it, versus just going to Radio Shack and buying a box. It isn't that cool. I have, I spent a hundred dollars. I must be cool. So back in my day, this is what we did. We'd build that thing and then we'd screw around with this stuff. And this was all the equipment we had to work on back in studios in the day. And you had to be able to take it apart and rebuild it from scratch all the way down to the actual electronic component level. One of my bitches and one of my hopes at the same time is that folks like Trevor and the DIY and the maker communities can start bringing back the concept of hands-on understanding what's going on underneath the hood. What is going on? How do you fix it? What makes it work? We're teaching people TCI, TCPIP. Oh, if you can spell it, you must be an engineer. Good, go get your CISSP. But can you take one of these things, can you take these things apart? Do you know how to replace a diode bridge inside of a power supply because it died? Can you configure one yourself because you don't have a spare Cisco router? For the mission critical components of where we know shit dies, we're not teaching it. We're in a completely disposable mindset society and that doesn't always apply when we're into mission critical operations in enterprises when they fail. Some of the DIY stuff, I mean, some things that are going phenomenal. This is DEF CON kids and they're teaching the kids how to solder and down to the component level and build circuit boards. That is awesome stuff and we need more of it. Complete educational, that, that's a community center teaching folks how, what's going on with the basic electronic components to get an understanding so they can appreciate the systems of, on top of it. The, I mean, you've seen some of the helicopters. This is all DIY stuff that is amazing. We have some of the printers out here. God knows where it's gonna go. But, again, should somebody buy that box, plug in the goop and output, or should they learn how to build the box, learn how to build the UAV? I argue, and maybe it's because I'm old and it was the way I grew up, learning how to build this stuff gave me such an incredible, rich engineering-based foundation that problem solving actually became part of the challenge and the fun of it because there was always an answer. You could always find an answer and you didn't have to throw your hands up. My final rant, we gotta be teaching failure. We're teaching people how to succeed. We need to teach them how to fail because that's how we learn. And I failed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times in the audio industry and in this industry, and hopefully learning something every time. Hands-on engineering. We were teaching me if you can push a button, you can administer a firewall. I'm sorry, where are the principles behind it? Where is the understanding of what is really going on under the hood here? We're not teaching engineering unless you become a CS, and I've seen CS graduates come out without a clue as to what fundamental engineering is. We're teaching tactical. That's all we teach these days. And I had a talk with Dan Keel from National Defense University on a TV show we were doing this morning. And it was, he said, we teach tactical really well. We don't teach strategic. The big thinkers, the big systems guys, the guys that came up with the IBM 360 in the late 1950s, that was big thinking. What's happened to the big thinking? We got Elon Musk doing some big thinking. We got a handful of people doing big thinking. But what happened to the rest of us? What happened to the community? And what happened to the kids? We're not teaching them how to do this stuff. And lastly, interdisciplinarianism. Just because you know TCPIP, yeah, that's really cool. But how do you combine TCPIP with a lockpick, with a UAV, with a, a, a laser? And how do you take all of that shit and communicate with aliens? I mean, I don't know what all the questions are. I don't know what the answers are. But I do know what interdisciplinarianism is. And that means being at least fluent in more than just the TCPIP drinking game. For those of you who've been out to those. So that's my final rant. You guys have been awesome, and I'll be here to answer any questions you might want. But that's my history, and I'm proud of it. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Check, check, check. Hey, uh, Wynn, do you know why they call it Formula 409? Formula 409. The cleaner. Do you know why they call it Formula 409? April 9th. No, there were actually 408 failures, failures before they got to that one. Oh, it's like Tom Edison yeah. with his, I found out 1999 ways not to build a light bulb. Exactly, exactly. 
Any thoughts, comments, questions? Am I off the mark here? Does this resonate with you? Does it make sense? You're shaking your head no and saying yes. That really bothers me. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. You want to hack the educate, my wife can speak on that. Where do you start and how do you make it happen? You know, w when I grew up, the Boy Scouts taught me a bunch. And that's kind of like, kind of gone off to the side now. Some of the fundamental things that we had uh, a generation or two ago was to uh, learn a little bit about everything and then kind of figure stuff out. And where do you want to go? Have a well-rounded education. Now, my edu I do, on Jeopardy, I do awful on literature and opera, but I do good on science and history. So my education is not all that well-rounded, but within geek land, I kind of speak a whole bunch of stuff. How are you going to battle that? At number one, it's got to be grassroots. And uh, what the hacker spaces have been doing, the DIYer, the maker communities, this is a grassroots effort that is attracting some attention. How do you get the schools to encourage the makers to get involved? It's got to be a joint effort. You've got to know a maker at your school. Come on in and do a class on something that's not evil, because you're not going to do lock picking at a, at a public school these days. Not more than once. <laughs> it, it doesn't work well to teach a uh, nine-year-old how to open a master lock with a uh, Coke can. It does not go over well. But teaching them how to solder and build, whether it's a crystal radio or whatever, whatever these days, Yes, it can be done, and it is being done, but it's got to be done more. How are you going to build this into curriculum? Um, and here in Tennessee, they're getting ready to have the Scopes trial again, so I don't have a whole lot of hope here in, right now. Uh, it's, it's, I can't help. I'm not sure that our school system is adaptable in the time necessary to educate and get kids involved. The biggest single rant that I'll have on this is if parents don't give a shit, the, the kids lose. And so that's, if, if you know some smart kids, encourage them, get them involved, challenge them, show them. Some of this stuff is just, I mean, UAVs, my God, that's robots, exoskeletons. That stuff is just so, it's cool. And it's got stepper motors and electronics and engineering and computers and all this crap built together. And that's where we're going. And material sciences and now the new graphene stuff. As a geek, this is just so exciting. Now, how do you create that excitement with kids? It's the same way my father did with me. I, think was come on down to the studio and he built a, stu uh, a speakeasy, a bar, and he said, learn how to wire. And I was crawling through ceilings when I was eight years old. Then we spent a weekend building a V8 motor together. Is there a big answer? Right now, I think it's grassroots and getting these guys in the community. This community is huge in this country and getting them to really participate out into the schools. Yeah. That's my best guess. Yeah. Um, I, I've got a, um, one of the best robotics competitions. I sponsor uh, a, a high school, or excuse me, a, a junior high uh, that is in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And they came to me and said, hey, we're trying to build this, this robot, and can you help us? And, well, I'll come out and, and you know, consult with you on it, because if I get involved in it, it's got to be perfect. But <laughs> to, put this, to watch these kids sit and play with this stuff and work around how to put these things together and make the ball go over here and crawl the pole and do all those things, uh, the important part of that is it's not going to work right the first time. And if you teach kids, you have to win every time. The best learning device is letting them fail. Do, do, I told you the thing about learning about electricity for the first time. You got to do it uh, <clears throat> overseas, uh, somewhere wild and crazy. I took a 110-volt uh, power cord that and went to a little it. light. Yeah. And, and I had always worked with DC, ooh, batteries and plugged stuff together. And I got a hold of a zip cord, you know, like a you know, lamp cord and was going to wire it to this light. And my father was at work, you know, he worked for Big K and he was doing his thing. Uh, you remember Big K. So anyway, um, so he comes home and I'm sitting on the couch and I've got this thing sitting on the, the coffee table in front of me and it's wired up and it's got electrical tape on it. And he's, uh, <clears throat> what are you doing? And I, well, I, I said, I was trying to do this, but... You know, I'm, I'm afraid to plug it into the wall. 
I don't know what's going to happen. And, and, and I didn't want my dad to get pissed because if you think I'm big, whoa. So my father says, well, have you plugged it in yet? And I said, well, actually, I'm really afraid to do it. I don't know what's going to happen. And he said, well, let's see it. And he grabbed a hold of the light, you know, the base in one hand, pulled the plug and shoved it into the wall. Boom, blew the fuse. Back in the day, we had a thing called a fuse. It's not a breaker. <laughs> And instantly, the house is dark. You know, the room we're in, and I think, I am a dead man. And my father reaches in his pocket, pulls his zippo out, flips, you know, gets a flame going. We wander through the house, and we go out into the rec room, and he flips open the fuse panel, he unscrews one, he tosses it down, he grabs another one, he screws it in place, the lights come back on. And I'm thinking, now he can see how to beat me. Wonderful! <laughs> and he sat down, and he said, let's see what you did wrong. And he starts to unwrap the tape, and he gets to a certain point. And if you've seen Stranded Wire, you know, everything kind of gets out of the line. One had actually uh, done a short circuit to the other set of wires, and you could see where it melted. And he explained to me exactly how that went. And then we wired it up correctly, and he plugged it in the wall, and the light worked. And to me, I will never forget that, because that was not, you didn't do it right. I'm going to beat you upside the head. It was, let's examine why it didn't work and figure out how to make it work correctly the next time. And that was one of the things that actually got me going. Doing things myself was not that you know I had to search for, for, for perfection. It was, boy, I don't want to screw that up again. I got to make sure that wires don't cross. You know what? That's a very important lesson the rest of your life. Don't cross the wires. That's it. Well, I, I've yeah. learned over the years, oh, my wife is the only one that's allowed to use the hammer in the house, and I call 911 <laughs> to change light bulbs. The That's thing that you have to keep in mind as well as part of the final rant is, I guess most of you are aware that you know, we all, in the last 20 years, we've grown up TCPIP software, yada, yada, yada. We're moving into a new phase, and this new phase is we're combining all the intelligence that we've learned with physical systems. And fundamental engineering is going to have to return to the fold as we integrate these various disciplines together. And that raw engineering 101 concepts and principles which have not historically applied in many cases or been applied into the quote unquote cyber world with very few exceptions, those rules are going to have to be completely rewritten in the next few years if we're going to make any of this shit work. <laughs> any other comments or questions? All right, I'm out of here. Thanks so much. We'll see you later. Uh, so, uh, G Mark just. Uh, tapped me on the shoulder and uh, he was wanting me to ask, uh, does anyone in the room uh, want to claim responsibility for NSA.gov going down? You're more than welcome to pull your phone out, but apparently, but apparently 